Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel and welcome to Mystery Monday. This week's case, <laughs> this week's case got to me and all the cases that I look into, they do get to me. A lot of them, especially the Madeline McCann case, stuck with me and I still think about it every day. I still think about her every day. But for some reason, the girl in this case, she spoke to me. I usually spend a lot of time with the pictures of the victims looking at them, looking at their faces. I like to listen to statements from people who knew them personally to get an idea of what kind of person they were like before they went missing or before they died. I want to know about their life as well as their disappearance or death. With this case, Tara Calico, I felt very connected to her. I felt, I felt like I understood her and because of that, as I went into investigating and researching, I just got more and more upset about the way the case went, about how it was handled, about what happened to her, and about how it's still kind of unresolved and hanging in the air today, even though I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people out there who know what happened to her, but they aren't talking. So with that being said, let's just get right into it. On the morning of September 20th, 1988, a 19-year-old college sophomore left the home in Bellin, New Mexico that she shared with her mother, Patty Doyle, and her stepfather, John Doyle. She would go on a bike ride every morning, and this morning she got a little bit of a late start. Tara Calico was pretty athletic, tall, well-liked by everybody. She was also a very structured and organized person. Person. She had this habit of kind of scheduling her days so she could make sure that she got everything in. And I can relate to that, maybe because I'm a little bit of a procrastinator. The night before my day starts, I kind of write a list of the things I have to do and block off my day to make sure I can do everything and I get everything important done. And I have to do that or else I'll kind of just go off on a tangent and probably not get any of that stuff done. But the reason Tara really scheduled her day was because she was busy, she loved life, there was a lot of activities she wanted to do, and she really enjoyed being on a schedule. It made her feel good, it made her feel like she knew what to expect and what was coming. Tara was a super busy young woman. She attended classes at the University of New Mexico Valencia branch. She had a job. She was in a relationship with a young man named Jack Cole, who had been the quarterback of the football team when they were in high school together. He was handsome. He was also really well liked. Together they made this really nice, perfect all-American couple. The morning of September 20th when Tara left to go on her bike ride, it was a little different than a normal morning. She typically would leave a little earlier to start her day and to start her bike ride because like I said, she really wanted to make sure she fit everything in and she was running a bit late this morning. I'm not sure why, but she didn't leave until 9.30. She had also gotten a flat tire on her own bike a few days before on her bike ride, so she ended up taking her mother's pink coffee instead. When she left the house that day, she told her mother, Patty Doyle, if I'm not back by noon, come get me and pick me up and bring me home because she had a tennis date with her boyfriend, Jack Cole, at 12.30 and she also had a class at 4 p.m. Tara's usual route would take her down Route 47 and it consisted of 36 miles round trip. So you can kind of see what I mean about her being a really structured individual and also trying to fit everything in because 36 miles at a fast clip for an experienced biker would still take about four to five hours. She didn't leave till 9.30 in the morning and had to be back by noon. So she really didn't give herself enough time that morning to complete her usual bike ride, which is probably why she told her mother, if I'm not back at noon, come grab me. Tara really just wanted to get that bike ride in. She felt better when she started her day with a good, like brisk physical activity. And then she was gonna go play tennis. So that's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of physical activity. I like to go to the gym every morning, but I probably wouldn't go to the gym for five hours in the morning and then hit up the tennis courts because that's, that's a lot. So she grabbed her mother's pink coffee, she popped on her Walkman, yes, Walkman, this is 1988, so it's even before the days of the Discman. And if I have some younger viewers here, a Discman was actually a big kind of like box that you would put a CD in and use headphones, not wireless, plugged in headphones, and you could listen to your CD on, on the Discman. 
I had one in middle school and I would listen to it on the bus in the morning. A Walkman went even further back and you could listen to your cassette tape on it. Um, I actually preferred the Walkman to the Discman because I don't know if you had a Discman guys, but mine always skipped. It drove me crazy. You'd have to keep it like really completely still and it wasn't one of those things you could just throw in your purse or your bag and still listen to because the disc would always skip. Thank God for MP3s. So anyways, sorry for that little tangent and blast from the past, but Tara was listening to a Boston tape that morning. She popped it into her Walkman, put her headphones on, got on her mother's pink coffee, and took off on her usual bike ride. So when Tara didn't return by noon, her mother, Patty, didn't think anything of it because her daughter said, I probably might not be back by noon, so come grab me. So she got in her car at 12.05 and drove down Tara's usual route to go pick her up. And Patty knew the route because she had often been on the same bike ride with her daughter. The reason Patty stopped going on these bike rides though is because she suspected at one point on one of their rides, somebody was following them and kind of watching them and it freaked her out. So she stopped going on the bike rides and she suggested that Tara start bringing Mace with her when she went on her bike rides. But Tara thought, her mother was just overreacting. That's how teenage girls are, and teenage boys too. They feel like their parents are crazy and worry too much. They feel like they are young and strong and nothing bad can ever happen to them. So Patty drove all the way down to 47 and she didn't see her daughter. She drove back home and checked the garage to see if Tara had kind of gotten home and she'd missed her and she parked the bike in the garage, but there was no bike there. So she woke up her husband, John Doyle, and told him, I'm gonna go look for Tara. She's not out on her route. She's not home. She has an appointment. She doesn't miss appointments. So she definitely would be here by now. If something wasn't wrong, I'm gonna go look for her. So she checked around their local area, which was called Rio Communities. She checked you know, the, the nearby expressways and then she came back to her house House and check the garage again to see if the bike was parked there but it still wasn't and that's kind of when she panicked because at this time it's about 12 35. So at this point Tara's boyfriend Jack Cole he's expecting her for tennis and when she doesn't show up he calls her parents house and they tell him she's missing she's nowhere to be found and he says I'll be right over. When he gets there all three of them Jack Cole her boyfriend John Doyle, her stepfather, and Patty Doyle, her mother, they all go out to look for her, basically retracing her steps. While they were out on 37 in the surrounding areas, they saw a couple people. First, they saw a few men working on a fence post, like building a fence post, and they asked the men, had they seen Tara? And they said they hadn't, but they had left probably between 11 and 11.30 to go grab some food and drinks, so they might have missed her, but they would keep an eye out for her. They were very helpful, they were very cooperative. Shortly into searching for Tara, Patty, Jack, and John thought if they split up and went separate ways, they could cover more ground and would have a better chance of finding her. So Patty actually was around the south entrance of JFK campgrounds, and she noticed a dirty white or gray truck with a homemade camper on the back of it, and there was three men standing outside of it and drinking beer. She went up to them and asked had they seen her daughter, and they said they hadn't. They said they'd been there since 11 a.m. and there'd been no sign of her, but they were also really defensive and dismissive to her. They didn't really want to help. They didn't have anything to offer, and once they said their piece, they kind of just stared at her until she walked away. Once Jack, John, and Patty reconvened after going their respective ways and told each other what they had seen, what they had found out, who they had talked to, Jack and John thought that the truck at the campgrounds was a little suspicious, maybe worth looking into, so they went back there around 3.15 to see if those men were still there, and they were. Once again, the men got defensive, even more so most likely because it was two males approaching them instead of just one female, and the three men actually almost formed like a barricade in front of the truck, not actually forcibly removing them from coming closer to the truck, but kind of in a physical manner standing by the truck as if to say, you know, you can stay right there. You don't need to come any further. And they basically told Jack and John the same story, except it changed a little bit when they said they'd been there since 11.30 a.m. and had not seen Tara. At 4.30 p.m., the police finally felt like becoming involved. Patty had called them right when Tara went missing, and they kind of brushed her off. 
They said Tara was a grown woman. She was 19 years old. She'd probably run off and she's a grown up. So she has every right to kind of disappear and go where she wants if, if she wants to. Patty insisted to them that Tara loved her life. She had a strong network of friends. She was studying psychology at the local university. She had a job. She had a great relationship with her family. She loved her life. There'd be no reason for her to run away from it, but they kind of once again dismissed her. I want everybody to know that if anybody you know or love ever goes missing and you're worried about them, there is no time limit when you can call and report them missing. Do not wait 24 hours or two hours. It doesn't matter if it's a false alarm. It doesn't matter if they end up showing up later. Please report them missing immediately. As soon as you realize something is off, as soon as you don't know where they are, report them missing. And if the police tell you you have to wait 24 hours or eight hours or whatever, ask to talk to a different police officer and keep pressing. That used to be the case, I think, a long time ago where they would say you have to wait 24 hours to report somebody missing, but that is no longer the case, especially now that authorities have discovered the first couple of hours after a person goes missing are the most crucial. And those hours are the most likely time when you will actually find this person or find evidence relating to this person. At 4.30, Patty and a police officer from the Valencia County Sheriff's Office, they drive back by the JFK campgrounds and those men in the dirty gray or white truck with the homemade camper, they are still there. But they've moved their vehicle, which seemed strange. They were parked in one place when Patty and John and Jack had spoken to them and parked in an entirely different place when Patty and the police officer drove by. The day of September 20th came and went without any sign of Tara and I'm sure Patty and her family had a really sleepless night that evening. Patty and her daughter were really close. She knew she wouldn't run away. She knew something had happened to her. She knew something was off. And so early the next morning, like first thing, as soon as it was light out, Patty went back out to Highway 47, and this time she drove really slowly along the highway to see if she could find any sign of her daughter, any sign that Tara had been there. Personally, I've never been to New Mexico, but as far as I can discern, Highway 47 is a really long highway. It cuts through three counties. Bernalillo County, Valencia County, and Socorro County. The highway itself isn't one of those big highways, like four, five, six lanes. It's a two-lane highway, one going northbound, one going southbound. And it can get pretty busy because a lot of people use that highway to commute to Albuquerque, which is a, a bigger city in New Mexico. And it's really rural. Like it's kind of in the middle of the desert. You know, it's New Mexico. There's mountains, there's sand. This highway could get really rural. There was also more populated areas like housing developments, golf course, areas where there was more people around, but because of Tara's long route, she would go through both of these types of areas, populated areas and more rural, kind of out of the way areas. As Patty was creeping along the side of the road, she found something that pretty much turned her blood cold and reinforced her that Tara had met foul play. She found a Boston cassette tape on the side of the road in the dirt and that had been the cassette tape that Tara had been listening to and she left that morning. Police also discovered broken parts of Tara's Walkman as well as a bike reflector by the JFK campgrounds. Patty identified the Walkman in the tape as being her daughter Tara's and the police said it wasn't really enough to determine if foul play had happened, but Patty thought that Tara had left these pieces behind, almost like a breadcrumb trail to let people know where she was so they could find her. At this point, a lot of eyewitnesses came forward saying they had seen Tara that morning riding her bike. A lot of them saw her every day riding her bike. It was her routine. Everybody knew she did it and where she went. But some of these witnesses also recall a gray or white truck with a camper on the back following behind her. And they also say that Tara didn't seem to know she was being followed as she was into her bike ride, listening to music, and kind of wasn't aware that anybody was behind her. Later in the video, I will get into those eyewitness statements in more detail because they are very important. Once all the pieces of the puzzle kind of fell together, the things they'd found on the side of the road, the eyewitness statements, the fact that Tara still hadn't shown up and didn't appear to be anywhere, the police finally said, okay, we think she's probably been abducted and they extended their search farther talked to the news, put pictures of her out, you know, kind of went all out at that point. 
There were leads coming in, but every one of them kind of led to a dead end. In June of 1989 though, everybody would be shocked when a piece of possible evidence turned up 1,700 miles away from Bellin, New Mexico. On a hot summer day in Port St. Joe, Florida, a woman who had just left the grocery store was walking in the parking lot of the grocery store and saw a Polaroid laying in an empty parking spot. Not a curiosity, she picked it up. The picture showed a terrifying scene. Two young people, a teenage girl and a young boy, were in this picture with their arms apparently bound behind their back and black duct tape over their mouths. They appear to be in the back of like a cargo van of some kind. There's a bunch of different colored blankets and sheets underneath them. They're in super uncomfortable positions. The boy looks terrified and the girl looks kind of pissed off. She's looking at the camera like she doesn't want the person taking the picture to know she's scared. She's defiant. She's strong. There's also a buck in the picture next to the teenage girl and it was laying closed with the spine of the book facing towards the camera and the book was My Sweet Audrina by V.C. Andrews. It appeared that there was also a phone number written on the book but the picture quality is so low it was a Polaroid so once again if I have young viewers here a Polaroid picture was taken from this big camera with this big flash and the picture would come out immediately and you'd kind of have to shake it. I guess you're not supposed to shake it. It was a myth, but you would have to wait for it to develop. Once the picture developed, it's, it's cool and the notion's pretty interesting, but the picture quality wasn't what it is today, that's for sure. And it's also hard to kind of digitally enhance the picture from a Polaroid. The photo was showcased on a television show called A Current Affair, and A Current Affair basically talked about cases and crimes and things like that that were a little bit smaller so they weren't covered by the bigger news media outlets. A friend of Tara's stepfather, John Dole, told him he'd seen the picture on the show and that he thought it looked like Tara. So John Doyle actually called the Valencia Police Department and reported that there might be a break in the case. And Tara's family, especially Patty, believed that the girl in the picture was Tara. They believed it looked like her, and the girl in the picture had a scar on her leg that was identical to a scar that Tara had on her leg from a car accident in high school. Another reason that Patty Doyle thought this was her daughter was because the book, My Sweet Audrina, was Tara's favorite book, and V.C. Andrews was her favorite author. Now, we can't really look too much into that because in the 80s, V.C. Andrews was kind of the author of the moment, kind of like a J.K. Rowling or a Stephanie Myers sort of thing. Every young girl read her books. I looked into the book, My Sweet Audrina. I'm a big fan of YA novels, young adult novels. I don't know why, I just enjoy reading them, and it's kind of disturbing for a young adult novel. The subject matter was very mature. I mean, it's dark to say the least. YA novels nowadays I don't think are as dark, but I could be wrong. The book was filled with characters who were literally action-packed with issues, and some of the subject matter covered was rape, murder, incest, miscarriages, infidelity, personality disorders, they threw in an amputee character. It wasn't uncommon for a teenage girl in the 80s to have a copy of My Sweet Audrina or another V.C. Andrews book in her hands is what I'm trying to say. I'm sorry, I feel like I'm going off on tangents in this video, just bear with me. The woman who found the picture claimed that previously that parking spot that had been empty when she found the Polaroid had been occupied by a white cargo van and a man who was about in his 30s and had a mustache was driving the cargo van. They set up roadblocks, they searched for the vehicle, they kind of showed the picture around, but they didn't find anything. Polaroid was contacted and the photo was examined and they got back to the police and said that the picture had to have been taken after May of 1989 because that particular film was not being used before then. Now Tara's mother really I think thought this was Tara in the picture until the day she died in 2006. Let's take a really quick look at the similarities between Tara and the girl in the picture. They're both Caucasian, they both have brown hair. Tara's mother points out the scar on the girl's leg in the picture is the same as the scar on Tara's leg. They have a similar eyebrows, they have a similar face shapes, 
but it's really hard to tell because Tara took care of her appearance. She filled in her eyebrows, she wore makeup, she did her hair up, and the girl in the picture obviously doesn't have any makeup on. Her hair's kind of a mess. And a big distinguishing characteristic about her physical appearance, which is her mouth, is covered by the duct tape. Another New Mexico family came forward saying that they thought the boy in the picture was their nine-year-old son, Michael Henley, who had gone missing when he went on a camping trip with his father in the Zuni Mountains. However, in 1990, the boy's remains were found just a few miles away from the campsite, and authorities believe he wandered away and died of exposure. Three agencies examined this photograph, Scotland Yard, the FBI, and Los Alamos National Laboratory. Scotland Yard concluded that they believed it was Tara in the picture. The Los Alamos Laboratory said they didn't think it was, and the FBI came up with inconclusive results. So that pretty much tells you everything you need to know about this picture. I think a lot of people wanted to believe it was Tara. I think it gave her family hope that she was alive. I do not believe the girl in this picture is Tara because of the following things about the case I'm going to tell you. But first, let me address, if this picture is not Tara, and it's clearly not Michael because his remains were found, these two kids in this picture, I do believe were in trouble at some point, and that's kind of a concern that I don't know if anybody ever addressed. Some people thought it was a hoax. I don't think it was a hoax, and here's why. If it was, it was pretty nationally publicized. It was put on TV shows, especially when it became involved in the Tara Calico case. I just feel like somebody who knew this young girl or this young boy who had staged this picture would have come forward at some point and been like, no, they're fine. I'm in chemistry class with that girl or I saw that kid at the grocery store last week. You know, somebody in their community, in their natural environment, friends, family, whatever, would have come forward at some point and said, that's obviously a hoax because these people are fine and dandy. So I think that something was really wrong with these kids. I wonder if they were brother and sister. I wonder if the people that were keeping them in the back of the van were their actual immediate family and they were being abused and that's why nobody reported them missing and that's why nobody reported that it was their kids in that picture when the picture was publicized. So that concerns me, and to me, that's a whole other mystery all on its own. Okay, so let's get back to Belen, New Mexico. We took a little short trip to Florida, but we are back. Because I don't believe that Tara ever left Valencia County. And a lot of other people don't believe she did either. Years and years after Tara's disappearance, little things started coming out about what happened to her. Let me start by talking about Melinda Esquivel, and I'm so sorry if I pronounced her name incorrectly. I'm pretty sure I got it right, but if I did pronounce it incorrectly, I tried. Melinda Esquivel was a classmate of Tara's in Bellin County. She actually went to school with her, and they weren't really like friends, they weren't that close, but Melinda remembers Tara as being a really kind, amazing young woman. I guess they had gone on a band trip together once and Melinda was kind of alone. She didn't have any friends with her. She was feeling probably a little insecure and sad and awkward and Tara had come over to her and basically was like, hey, come on over, hang out with us. Tara could tell that the girl was you know, feeling bad and she didn't want to see anybody feeling badly. So she involved her and included her in her own group of friends. To me, that kind of kindness is not normal in a high school student, especially not a high school girl because when you know they call high school girls mean girls, they're not really exaggerating. A lot of them are super mean. But Tara was not. Tara was a kind-hearted person. She didn't want to see this girl alone, feeling sad. She included her in on her group of friends and Melinda always remembers that. So when Melinda left, New Mexico. She never forgot about Tara, but just assumed that it was a cold case. When she went back to Bellin for a holiday, Melinda found out some things that really shook her to her core. She was hanging around with a bunch of classmates, people that she used to go to high school with, friends that she used to hang out with, and she brought up Tara and said, you know, it's really sad. She was such a nice girl. I wonder what happened to her. And they pretty much looked at her and said, we all know what happened to Tara. Everyone in Belen knows what happened to Tara. 
And she was like shocked, you know? She said, what do you mean everybody knows what happened to Tara? And that's when she kind of came into the conclusion from what she was told and little bits and pieces that she heard from different people that Tara had died in Valencia County and been involved in a cover-up because the men who killed her were pretty connected in the community. I guess Melinda studied filmmaking in college and she decided she wasn't going to let the disappearance and possible death of somebody who had been so kind to her and such a light in the world go unresolved. So when Melinda finally got the idea that this had been a cover up and a lot more people knew about what happened to Tara than anybody could even begin to guess, this was years and years later. I mean, she had gone to college, moved to California, had a job. She actually created a podcast and a documentary and there's a website and a Facebook page. And I highly suggest listening to the podcast if you're interested in this case because there's a lot more detail in there than I could ever hope to fit into one episode. I did my best, but it's such a literal black hole of information. It's such a twisting and turning path. And sometimes you'll find yourself confused and sometimes you'll say, wait, this doesn't add up. And sometimes you'll just be completely shocked at how something like this could happen in real life and not just on a movie screen. But I will link everything that Melinda has done in the description box of this video. I wish I had come across the podcast a little bit sooner in my investigation into this case because I would have reached out to her and kind of gotten like more of her personal take on it because I truly think she would have responded. She is a person who wants to see justice happen for Tara. But anyways, Melinda and Michelle, Tara's stepsister, they started looking into this case and they actually were given access to police records, which they were like, yay, this is great. But then they realized that these police records were literally a mess, like in a shambles, I think she said. There were folders marked with people's names who were witnesses or people of interest that had nothing in them. There was files in folders they shouldn't have been. There was big chunks of information just missing that looked like they'd been previously there, but had been, I don't know, lost or removed. There was reports of interviews being done that had audio tapes affiliated with them, but the transcripts and the tapes were not there and were never found. So this supported to Melinda and to Michelle as well that there was something bigger going on, something that the Sheriff's Department might be involved with. I'm going to give you a little bit of information on the Valencia County Sheriff's Department really quick, like who was in power, who was in charge, who was calling the shots. Lawrence Romero Sr. was a native New Mexican and he worked several jobs in several different police departments throughout New Mexico. He was attracted to a career in law enforcement because of the excitement that it offered him. Lawrence was kind of a thrill seeker in his youth he used to race cars and was kind of into that whole lifestyle. And so obviously he would seek out a job which would provide him that thrill and excitement. In 1970, he moved his family to Belen, New Mexico because he wanted a quieter place to settle down. And Belen was, like we said, a small town where everybody knows everybody. It was thought then to be a really good place to raise a family, a safe place. He took a job with the Belen Police Department, and in 1971, he received his certification after graduating from the New Mexico Sheriff's Academy. His leadership quality soon drew the attention of his superiors, and he was eventually promoted to the assistant police chief. He became really popular in the community, really well known. I guess he was a little bit of a partier, kind of like a good old boy. And it was suggested to him that he should run for sheriff, which he did in 1974. I guess for the most part, he did a really good job as sheriff. And like I said, he was well liked and well respected. From the outside, he looked like a man that had it all together. He had a really happy family, kids, a wife, the whole nine. He actually purchased a bar at one point, which it was his bar, so he ran it, which kind of seems strange to me. I mean, I guess, I don't know. I don't know, right? Does it seem strange? Like, a, a bar is a place where scuffles and things usually happen, and now you have the sheriff of the county owning and running the bar, but anyways, he owned and ran this bar and would often be there himself drinking quite heavily. And he developed a problem with alcohol. And I'm sure the problem with alcohol was always there, but when he became the owner of the bar and it was kind of his environment, it, it got out of control. Allegedly, according to Lawrence, you know, he got really sick 
from drinking so much. He was bedridden at one point because of some liver problems. His doctor said, you know, you can't drink anymore. And one night while he was closing down the bar, he saw himself in the mirror of the bar and kind of felt guilty and didn't recognize the person in the mirror. And he realized, you know, he wanted to see his kids grow up. So he asked God for the power to overcome the demon of alcoholism that had crept into his life. And from that point on, he was a changed man, according to him. Um, he stopped drinking and cleaned himself up and got his life back together. So Lawrence Romero Sr. was obviously very heavily involved in Tara's case. The search efforts for her and the investigation in general. He was actually in charge of it. Lawrence said about the case, we put a lot of man hours into the search without success. What is really sad is that to this day a mother and father are left with unanswered questions about what happened to their daughter. There is no closure to the heartache and grief. It may not make sense why I went so deeply into the life and personality of Lawrence Romero Sr., but it will soon. So let's talk about the eyewitnesses who saw Tara that day riding her bike and saw a truck following her. There was four people hunting that day in the general area of JFK campgrounds. Three adults and one child. They were interviewed on September 24th, 1988 after seeing a picture of Tara on the news. According to the hunters, they were traveling on Highway 47, coming from Corona where they had been hunting that day. They pulled over by the south entrance of JFK campgrounds in order to discharge their rifles, and that's when they saw Tara riding her bike. One of the hunters who was the driver of their vehicle, he said he saw a man in a truck watching Tara really intently. All the hunters that day said they thought it was odd because at first they thought the man in this old Ford truck was probably somebody who's with Tara, maybe like her father or somebody who's just kind of following behind her to make sure she was okay. But when they saw the weird intent way he was staring at her, they kind of thought twice about that. But because they didn't really know and they just kind of assumed he was with her, they didn't do anything about it. After they had given their statements, they took a drive along with Sheriff Romero, Lawrence Romero Sr., and he had them show him where they'd seen her. And it happened to be right about the place where the pieces of her Walkman were found and the bike reflector. In the police files, it shows that two of the hunters were hypnotized in order to kind of get more information, see if they could remember anything under that state. But the results of what was said or what happened in those sessions was missing from the police records. Ishmael De La Rosa is another witness who saw Tara riding her bike that day. Ishmael is my favorite eyewitness in this case. He just seems like such a super nice concerned guy and somebody who is a really caring person. But anyways, Ishmael was driving on Highway 47 toward Belen to go to Cottonwood at Dairies because he was picking up some new calves. He also had a dead calf in a horse trailer that he was pulling behind his truck and he had an appointment with the veterinarian that same day to get that calf autopsied because the calf had died and he didn't know why and it was kind of important to figure out why. If it was like a disease that could spread to the other cows, he had to know, so he needed to get the calf autopsied. He was in a rush and he remembers kind of being stressed out because a truck in front of him was driving really, really slowly. And because of the fact that he had this really big like trailer on the back of his car and 47 is a two lane highway and it's kind of narrow with traffic coming this way and going this way, he wasn't able to pass the slow moving truck. He was really agitated that it was going so slow. His wife had called ahead to make an appointment at the veterinarian. He had to get to the Cottonwood Farms. He had to get to the vet on time. So his memory of this day is really clear because he just remembers being like in a hurry and agitated and this truck in front of him was driving real slow. The truck in front of him was a 1950s Ford truck described as being kind of dirty white or gray. In fact, Ishmael remembers it being really kind of primer paint with some other paint kind of splattered on there and it had a homemade camper on the back of it. When he first came upon the pickup, he thought it was broken down on the side of the road because coming up on it, it was driving so slowly, it looked like it was stopped. When he got closer, he realized it was not broken down, that it was just driving really, really slowly. And that's when he got stuck behind it. 
As he was driving up towards the truck that he thought was stopped, he remembers seeing a dark figure run from the side of the road and hop into the truck. And he said at first he thought it was a black dog because it was moving really, really fast and it was just this dark shape. He was still a little bit further away from the truck so he couldn't see clearly. And then he realizes that it was just a person who was kind of bent over and running to stay out of view most likely. He never did get a good look at that mystery passenger who ran from the side of the road and got into the truck, but he did get a pretty good look at the driver. Once he got closer to the truck, he noticed the truck was following slowly behind a girl on a bike. Like the hunters, Ishmael at first thought that this was her father. He thought maybe the girl just liked to ride her bike and her father was following behind her in case she got tired and he would just take her bike and put it in the truck. And he remembers thinking, how difficult it would be to fit the bike in through the little tiny door of the homemade makeshift camper on top of the truck, but he thought it was the girl's father. At one point, it became kind of possible for him to be able to pass the truck. Traffic on the other side of the highway had kind of slowed down and there was a little gap, so he pulled up next to the truck and that is when he got a look at the driver. A couple things really stood out to Ishmael about the driver and the vehicle he was driving. First, he thought it was weird the way that the driver was staring at the girl on the bike. That's when he kind of decided, like, this is not her father. This is not the way a father looks at a young girl riding a bike. He kind of thought that the driver was intently kind of staring at her butt on the, the bike seat. You know, when you're riding a bike and it's you're kind of bouncing on the seat. And that's when he was like, oh, this creeps like actually probably following her and watching her. He also noticed how bright red the driver's hair was. He said when the sun hit it, it was almost like an orange. It was so red. He had on this tan sort of like Elmer Fudd hat almost, not really a hunting hat. Ishmael referred to it as a Kmart special, something you just grab at Kmart, but it had those flaps you could pull down over your ears if they get cold. He was really, you know, clean cut. He had really short short haircut, no sideburns, kind of like a military cut, but he did appear to have like two to three days worth of stubble on his face. Ishmael does recall that his eyes were bloodshot and his face seemed kind of puffy, like somebody who'd been drinking a lot the night before. He also saw on the left side of this man's face, which is the side that was facing Ishmael, that he had a scar on his left eye, which was pretty evident, going like all the way from his eye to his temple. Ishmael says he never saw the man's right side and he never saw the other passenger in the car, but when he looked in the back, like towards the camper windows, he did notice there was about five or six khaki shirts hung up in the back of the camper. And he noticed they were really pressed. They were really neat, pressed like they just come from the launders, but the way they were hanging in the truck was kind of strange. They were hanging side by side, like overlapping a little bit so that you just couldn't see anything. You might ask, why does Ishmael have so many details about this? But it's funny, he used to be in the clothing business. He was in the clothing business for like 20 years. So he says anything to do with clothes, like he's got a really good eye for. He could look at somebody and just be able to tell their size. I mean, Ishmael was a character. I really enjoyed reading his interview and the things he was saying. He was, he was a good guy. Ishmael Delarosa knew there was something not right about the way this man was watching her. He had definitely determined at this point it was not her father or really anybody who knew her. He was worried about Tara. He kind of noticed that she didn't know anybody was following behind her. She had her headphones on, she was focused on her bike ride, and she didn't seem aware that there was a truck following behind her. And the truck wasn't really that close behind her. It was keeping some distance, almost as if to not be seen. By her so he passes the truck and he's driving and he's kind of trying to decide what to do like should he say something should he do something and as he drives up further he sees a couple more people he sees two men who appear to be nicely dressed in sports coats and they're just kind of walking on the highway but on the other side of the fence so more in like a field or sandy area he sees two cars that are parked one on either side of the road a white one and a black one and there's a man in a white t-shirt leaning against the white car and then a little further up over a hill he sees another car that appears to have been broken down because the hood's open and there was like five people standing around the car he refers to them as wetbacks that is not my term i'm just trying to be true to the case, but he referred to them as wetbacks, which I think it just means somebody who's from Mexico, or it's definitely like a derogatory term. It's not a nice thing to say. 
But that's what he said. He said there was four men and one girl. He said one of the men was really tall and skinny and had a shirt off and was kind of just messing around, like bouncing all over. It seemed to be hyper. He thought maybe they were on drugs or something. And he also thought it was strange that the engine was open, like the hood to the car was open and the engine was right there. But nobody was looking into the engine or seemed to be trying to fix the car. So they were just kind of messing around on the side of the road. So then he started worrying about these guys. Were they gonna whistle at Tara as she went by? Were they gonna give her trouble? But he then spotted that there was three women playing golf, three older women playing golf on a golf course right by where this car was parked. And he assumed if these Mexican men standing at the parked car gave Tara any trouble when she drove by on her bike, that these older women playing golf would step in and, and you know say something. And so he thought she was going to be safe. He didn't think really anything more about it. He later heard about the story of Tara going missing on the radio. So basically, Ishmael didn't put two and two together because when he was looking at the news reports and hearing the news reports, they basically just kept talking about the mountain region and not the highway. He was having coffee a couple of days later with a friend and he said something along the lines of, this is so weird, why would a young girl be driving her bike out in that area? It's like in the middle of nowhere. And the friend said, no, no, she didn't go missing from that area, she went missing from the area of Highway 47 and that's when it clicked in his head and he kind of like felt guilty. His friend called the tip line and the next day, Ray Flores from the Valencia County Sheriff's Department contacted Ishmael. At this time, Ray Flores was captain under Sheriff Lawrence Romero Sr. Ray Flores did interview Ishmael and got his statement, but Ishmael recalls the way he was treated by Flores surprised him, especially since he thought he had a pretty good lead and had gotten a really good look of the man who was driving the truck that was following Tara that day. Ishmael said it didn't really seem like Flores wanted to take his statement, like he was kind of being a bother and that this was pointless. So he was asked some questions. He was also asked to bring Ray Flores to the spot where he had first and last seen Tara. And Ray Flores also had him hypnotized just like the hunters in order to see if anything else would come out during that hypnotism. Ray told Ishmael that the next day they would go over and take a look at some pictures of pickup trucks so that Ishmael could kind of identify what kind of truck it was, like the make, the model, the year. Ishmael did say he thought it was a Ford pickup truck about 1953 or 1954. The next day they were supposed to meet at a restaurant before they went over to take a look at the pictures and Ishmael De La Rosa showed up and he waited and Ray Flores never showed. He called Ray to let him know he was there and he never got an answer or a call back. A year would pass until Ishmael heard from Ray Flores again. A month after this happened, Ishmael was in Albuquerque when he saw the exact same truck and the exact same driver. He went back to the Valencia County Sheriff's Department to let them know what he'd seen, tell them exactly and specifically where he'd seen this vehicle. And once again, was surprised at the way they treated him. He said he was brought into like this back room with two detectives who basically acted like they weren't interested in what he had to say, that he was overreacting, that he was being involved with things he really had no business being involved with. And he said it kind of, it hurt him, like it made him feel bad but he told them what he'd seen anyways, because at this point he was living pretty heavy with the guilt of having been one of the last people to see Tara, kind of knowing something seemed fishy about what was happening and not really stepping in to do anything. A year later in July of 1989, Ray Flores would reach out to Ishmael again and ask him to help them create a composite sketch of the driver of the truck that he had seen that day following Tara. While he was talking to Flores, Ishmael told him some interesting, basically local gossip that he had heard. He had a friend, Jack Aguayo, who basically said he thought his grandson, JJ Aguayo, was involved or responsible in somehow for Tara's disappearance. Apparently Ishmael was at his friend Jack's house and they were talking about Tara and that, you know, it was bad. Jack said something like, too bad that girl went missing. JJ was in the room at this time and he heard them talking and he kind of piped up with like, yeah, me and my buddies saw her. We were out hunting that day. I shot at a road sign with my rifle and saw a girl riding a pink bike. After JJ left the room, Jack turned to his friend Ishmael and said, I truly believe that my grandson knows what happened to that girl and is involved. 
Jack Aguayo owned a pretty big ranch with a lot of land, and he went on to say that he believed that girl might even be buried somewhere on his ranch. The night of Tara's disappearance, somebody had like come to his back gate, opened it, went in, and then left again, closing the gate behind them, and he said that it never happened. Like nobody ever went in and out of that back gate, so it was a strange occurrence. When they tried to contact J.J. Aguayo about these pretty hefty claims, he was actually found to be in a mental hospital in Texas. At this point, Jack Aguayo had kind of like gone from thinking something had happened, knowing something had happened, being pretty sure that J.J. had something to do with it, to kind of being like, eh, and then kind of at the end saying, like, I don't want to talk about this anymore, or like, I'm sorry I said anything, and had shut down. So on September 11th, 1991, a search warrant was filled out, signed, and enacted to search Jack Aguayo's ranch and property. In Tara Calico's police reports in the Valencia County Sheriff's Department's office, there's no file or statement or piece of paper saying if anything was ever found on this property or what happened when they actually went to, you know, fulfill the warrant. Ishmael De La Rosa died in 2010. Until his dying day, he drove around looking for that truck and looking for its driver. He didn't want to let it go. He felt a really big sense of guilt and responsibility for what happened. And because he was such a good guy and such a caring person, he couldn't let it go and move on. So he, until his dying day, his family says, continued looking for that truck and its driver. The next witness that we're gonna talk about is named Baron Freeman. When Melinda and Michelle were looking through the police files, they found an email from a man named Baron Freeman who said he had seen Tara that day riding her bike. There was also a handwritten note kind of giving a small statement about what Baron had said, yet there was no indication in the police reports or the files that he had ever been contacted or that his statement had ever been taken. In the fall of 2010, when Melinda and Michelle discovered this inconsistency in the police files, they actually reached out to Barron. There was a number on the email that he had sent to police, and they called it. They got a hold of his son, who then transferred them to his mother, who was Barron's wife. According to Barron, he had tried to tell his story to the police multiple times, and was brushed off, wasn't called back, was never brought in to give a statement for years. He tried to tell his story. In September of 2008, Baron Freeman read an article in the Albuquerque Journal, which frustrated him beyond no end. He was also a really funny guy. If you listen to the podcast, you can hear him give his statement and he's just a funny guy. But he was so frustrated because in the article, Sheriff Rene Rivera basically stated that like they knew or they had a pretty good idea of what had happened to Tara and who was involved, but without a body and without much evidence, they couldn't hold these people accountable. He believes that she was accidentally hit on the side of the road and that her body was hidden and covered up. And Baron was like, nope, that's not what happened. I saw what happened, that's false. He was so pissed off that he called the author of this article and let her know that there must be some kind of cover up going on because he had tried to tell his story to the police multiple times and nobody was interested. So the author of the article put him in touch with Sheriff Rene Rivera, who was the Sheriff of Valencia County at that time. 20 years and three days after Tara Calico's disappearance, Baron Freeman's official statement was finally taken. So according to Baron, he was on his way to the airport that day, September 20th. He was driving to the airport and he was passing through Belen and he kind of wasn't familiar with the area, so he kept getting turned around and he had to kind of catch his bearings. He remembers that it had been raining quite a bit in the days leading up to the 20th and so everything was just like gray, you know, gray sky, really like brown and tan landscape. So when he popped over this little hill, he could immediately see the hot pink of the bike that Tara Calico was riding. At this time, Tara Calico was riding northbound and Baron Freeman was driving southbound. So he had a good look at her face. He said she was brunette, young, pretty. From her body type and the shape that her body was in, he could tell she was a pretty avid biker. Um, she was tall, long-legged, and you know he just noticed her because of the bright pink of her bike. At the same time that he noticed Tara though, he noticed another vehicle. The vehicle was a dirty gray or white Ford truck with a white camper on it, and it was kind of parked on top of the hill where they would be looking at Tara from behind. 
Baron says the truck was pretty beat up and he noticed it was like packed to the gills, he said, like they were going on some kind of trip. It was packed up tight. As he passed the truck, he noticed the driver. He thought he was maybe about 50 Caucasian male. Nothing really stood out to him besides the way he was watching Tara so intently. Like all the other witnesses said, he was just staring at her and watching her. And Baron at first thought this must be her dad. You know, this young girl's riding her bike kind of in the middle of nowhere. He's probably just here to make sure she's safe. But he also got a feeling like the hunters and like Ishmael De La Rosa that this guy wasn't her father. He was looking at her kind of creepy. He was staring at her. He was kind of like smiling and Baron just didn't feel right about it. So he was kind of going in the wrong direction anyways and he had to make a U-turn, but he didn't want to make a U-turn directly behind the truck because he didn't want to freak out the guy if it was this young girl's father thinking that he was going to try to like hurt his daughter or something. So he kind of drove up a little bit more. He made a U-turn and he came back. And as he was coming back, he said to himself, I need to like, get this license plate just in case. He was that kind of guy. Like you could tell he was kind of an anxious, like overthinker. When you hear him talk, he's like an overthinker. It would drive me crazy, but he didn't have a pen in a paper. So he just kind of memorized it and ended up only remembering a couple numbers and letters from the license plate as he was driving back past the truck. So he would be going now southbound. He said, I'm going to look at this guy in the truck. I'm going to stare at him and hopefully he'll look at me and I can get a better look at him or something. And as he drove by, the guy was staring at Tara so intensely, so absorbedly that he never even glanced over at Baron driving by in his car. So Baron keeps driving and now he's like really kind of freaked out and he makes the decision. I'm just going to pull over and ask this girl, like, are you okay? But now he's on the side of the road that would put his passenger window at Tara's side of the road. So he felt like that would be kind of awkward. He didn't have power windows. So how was he going to pull up on this girl, roll down his window, ask her if she's okay without her getting freaked out that she was, you know, about to be abducted. Or if the guy in the truck was her dad without her dad getting freaked out and driving over and trying to shoot Baron for messing with his daughter. So at the very last moment, he kind of changed his mind about stopping and talking to her. But he did once again say, I'm gonna stare at her and look at her. And if she's in trouble, she'll give me some sort of sign that she needs help. He claims that as he was driving by Tara, he looked at her, slowed down really to like, you know, a slow pace and turned a full 90 degree angle. So he'd be staring her straight in the face. And he says she ignored him. She never looked at him. She never made eye contact. It was as if he didn't exist. So at this point he was like, well, you know, she's fine. She doesn't seem to be in trouble. She doesn't feel like she's in trouble. And he just kept going, you know, he had to make his flight and he had other things to do and whatever. He does recall he got about eight to 10 minutes down the road and this guy opened up and it poured like monsoon rains. And he thought like, oh, should I go back and see if she needs a ride? She's going to be soaked, but where would I put the bike? And that guy with her, you know, he, he's got her. She's okay. He can help her out. So he kept driving once again, like I said, an overthinker, he's not an impulsive sort of person. He's not a person who just says like, I'm going to turn around and see if she needs a ride and does it. He's a person that wonders if he should do something and then kind of thinks about every single outcome of that decision. So he just kept driving. He got to the airport. He says he was really, really early for his flight. He remembers buying a hunting and fishing magazine and kind of sitting in the airport for like 30 minutes waiting for his plane. And he said right before he boarded the plane, he thought, I hope that girl's okay. Baron didn't think about that girl on the hot pink bike again until a year later when he was reading a magazine article about Tara Calico's disappearance. In the article, it basically said that this girl was riding a pink bike and was possibly abducted by a man who was following her in a truck. He like grabbed the phone. He was going to call the police, but then he said, "Ugh, like, what am I going to say? I don't even remember where I was. It wasn't my neck of the woods. I was kind of lost. I don't remember where I was. What am I going to tell? these police officers, like I saw her, but I don't remember where. And so once again, overthinking, he hung up. 10 years later, Baron Freeman's wife would tell him that she went to the same gym as one of Tara Calico's cousins. And through this cousin, they actually got Patty Doyle's number and Baron called her. He kind of had been just like Ishmael weighed down with this guilt wondering if there was something more that he could have done or should have done. He met Patty at a coffee shop and they talked about everything he'd seen and he thought she was going to be mad at him. Um, but just like Tara, Patty seemed to be a very kind and loving person. And in a really 
selfless act of kindness, she told Baron not to feel bad. She said Tara was independent and kind of sassy and strong, and if he had pulled over and asked her if she needed help, she probably would have told him to buzz off anyways. So don't feel guilty. Even if he had stopped to talk to her, she probably would have just, you know, ignored you anyways. That's what we as women are pretty much taught to do, right? When we're out walking alone or on a bike alone, if somebody approaches us, either just like run away or ignore them and act like they're not talking to you because we're constantly afraid of being abducted or hurt. It's just kind of the world that we live in where women have to worry about being overpowered and hurt by strange men. Personally, I love riding my bike and I always make sure to stay on public roads. There's a beautiful canal path like right by my house, which is actually closer than most of the bike routes I take but it's so secluded, but it's beautiful. It's in the middle of the woods. It's right by the canal. It's gorgeous, but it is so secluded. It's not by any residential areas. There's not usually a lot of people on that path. And although I would much prefer taking that path, I don't because I'm afraid that I will be like come up upon by somebody and just like murdered or taken. We just have to be a little bit more careful. So Patty was really sweet telling Baron that and he actually died in 2009, obviously still carrying with him the thought that he maybe could have done more. Captain Don Darges was the one who took his statement and the documentary maker Melinda had actually questioned him about if um, Baron Freeman had ever been hypnotized like Ishmael had been, like the hunters had been, and Don said no, he wasn't there. He told Melinda he looked up the weather report for that day and it was sunny and clear and since Baron had described the weather as being rainy, he couldn't have been there. Melinda was like shocked when she heard this, absolutely blown away. Every single person she interviewed about the day Tara went missing had described the weather as being exactly as Baron Freeman had described it. Every picture showing people looking for Tara that day and the next day showed that it was gray and it was rainy. And she even has video footage of police officers being interviewed the day of Tara's disappearance and it's raining and gray. Moving on, there is another witness. This witness is a woman and she wants to be kept anonymous so we don't know her real name and she's obviously afraid for her life. We'll just call her Witness One as they do in Melinda's documentary and podcast. The morning that Tara went missing, this woman who was a young girl at the time was on her way to school and she was running late. She remembers driving by and seeing Tara riding her bike and she waved at Tara and Tara waved at her. They knew each other and they'd often see each other on this route because this woman would go to school early and Tara was out on her bike early, so they waved at each other and went on. As she kept driving though, she kind of pulled in front of a truck that was following behind Tara, and she remembers that the driver and the passenger gave her really dirty looks, and she thought it was because she had cut in front of them, but she didn't think anything really further into it because she was, like I said, running late for school and she was just kind of on to the next. Later that evening, her boyfriend who took part in searching for Tara would tell her that Tara had gone missing. And this is when this woman, Witness One, remembered, well, I saw her this morning and there was like a truck riding behind her. And Do you think it had anything to do with her disappearance? And he said, I don't know, but just call the police and let them know. So she did, she called the police told them what she had seen and the next day two detectives came to her house and took her statement. They brought with them photos, like a photo lineup, to see if she could identify the two men that she had seen in the vehicle and she did. She could identify them and she kind of remembers that they seemed familiar to her, like she had seen them around but she didn't specifically know who they were. So she identified the two men in the photo lineup and the officer said, great, thanks. If your information pans out or if we need anything more from you, we'll contact you and they never did. So witness one just assumed either her information wasn't useful or they just didn't need anything more from her and she went on with her life. It wasn't until several years later while she was reading a magazine article about the untimely death of Lawrence Romero Jr. The picture in the magazine of Lawrence Romero Jr. who had either committed suicide or been involved in a game of Russian roulette. That picture was the same one she had picked out of a photo lineup for the police officers that morning of the man she'd seen in the truck following Tara Calico. Now if that name sounds familiar to you, it is because Lawrence Romero Jr. was the son of Lawrence Romero Sr., Sheriff of Valencia County. The she knew it was him in the picture because he was a redhead, a very distinctive looking redhead. Now I have searched for pictures of this man and like I said, he died a couple years ago. They say it was either suicide or he was playing a game of Russian roulette and shot himself, which I mean, who's playing Russian roulette here? I mean, you have to be 
ingesting a lot of alcohol and a lot of drugs to wake up one day and say, a game of Russian roulette sounds fun. As witness one kind of got further into this whole case, she realized how deep it really went, how it was possibly a cover up considering that the man that she saw in the truck following Tara that day, the man that it appeared most everybody had seen in the truck following Tara that day, ended up being the sheriff of Valencia County's son, which is obviously a huge conflict of interest. Lawrence Romero Sr. was for a very long time directly in charge of Tara's case. And clearly, if we believe witness one, she picked out his son in a photo lineup and was never heard from again, and none of that information is in the police files at all. So at some point between her pointing out Lawrence Romero Jr. in the pictures and it getting back to the police station and being filed and reported correctly, that information just disappeared. Witness one also said she had worked with Rene Rivera before he became sheriff, and he told her he had a pretty good idea of what had happened to Tara and who'd been responsible. But he also said that the people involved were pretty connected, pretty influential, and high up in the community, and there was a lot of people who knew about it that were just covering it up. He even told her he knew where that mystery truck was, that it was in somebody's backyard in town covered up with a tarp, and that the bumpers had been removed. So let's go back a little bit. Remember J.J. Oejo? So Jack Oejo's grandson. Jack thought that J.J. had something to do with Tara's disappearance. Jack even thought Tara might be buried on his ranch. I don't think J.J. was ever questioned about Tara. I believe that he pretty much went off the map. They said he was at a mental institution in Texas, and I don't really know where he is now. But JJ said he was with Paul Zeiler the day that they were going hunting, the day that they saw Tara. Now, Paul was brought in for questioning. When Paul was asked where he was that day, he recalls that he and JJ had been hunting. He was asked what vehicle they were driving, and he says it was a silver one ton with a flatbed. In the interview, though, after he says it was a silver truck, he goes, or gray, I guess. He kind of mumbles it. He then is asked if he owns the truck that they drove that day any longer, and he says no, that he sold it. The officers don't let him know that JJ already admitted to having seen Tara that day and they asked him if he saw a girl riding a pink bike that day and he replied sure don't the way he responds to that sure don't like it's really cocky it shows somebody who is um, full of himself kind of overconfident about his role in the situation he then says that he and JJ went to Dot Canyon to hunt and camp out and they were there for a couple of days the police then ask him did you have a camper on your truck and Paul says no and the police then say to him well how did you camp out then where did you sleep and he says we just slept in a tent even though JJ claims they were supposed to go camping and hunting that day with a third person. Paul says there never was a third person. There was never supposed to be a third person. He doesn't know what JJ's talking about. Paul also claims he never met Tara and he never met Lawrence Jr. either. And in a town where everybody knew everybody, a small town, a small tight-knit community, it seems really difficult for me to believe at least that Paul didn't know Lawrence Jr. Of course, it comes out later that Paul and Lawrence Jr. of course did know each other. They purchased their drugs from the same place, they did drugs together, they drank together, they partied, and they would usually do all of this in Lawrence Jr.'s um, trailer. So Paul's interviewed for quite a while and finally, you know, they let him go, but then later they want to call him back and clear up some inconsistencies and ask a couple more questions, and at this point he lawyers up and refuses to come in again. J.J. Aguayo claims that he and Paul were supposed to go camping with a third party that day, that they were gonna use this person's truck, but then this third party who J.J. can't remember the name of, he disappeared and um, they couldn't use his truck, and J.J. ended up asking his grandfather, Jack, if they could use his truck, and Jack said no. Apparently, J.J. and his friends were really into drugs. He knew they were into drugs and he didn't trust them with his vehicle. A girl who used to hang out with JJ did come forward and say that once JJ brought her to this weird cave, and I don't know if he was on drugs or drunk at the time, but he just started talking about Tara and asking her if she knew Tara, and then he kind of unloaded on her, I guess. He told her that he couldn't do anything about what he knew about Tara because the son of the sheriff was involved. Finally, dying man Henry Brown requests an audience with Deputy Frank Menthola. 
Apparently Henry Brown, he was sick, he knew he was dying, and he wanted to make a deathbed confession. He wanted to get something off his chest that had been weighing on him for years. So he talked to Frank Menthola and told him that he used to hang out with a bunch of kind of troublemaking boys back in the day. Included in this troublemaking group of boys was Lawrence Romero Jr., the sheriff's son. Lawrence Jr. was allegedly a drug dealer and would sell drugs out of his small trailer. And he also had somewhat of a crush on Tara Calico. He had asked her out multiple times. He'd made advances at her multiple times. And of course she was politely turned him down because she already had a boyfriend. This is the first we've ever heard that Lawrence Jr. had been interested romantically in Tara Calico. So basically Henry and these boys would hang out in a makeshift basement under Lawrence Jr.'s trailer. And I don't understand even how that works. How do you make a basement under a trailer? Do you just dig out a hole in the dirt essentially? Is it just like a dirt hole covered by a trailer? I can't picture it, but I, I'm hoping it was more advanced than that because why would anybody want to go sit in a hole in the ground and drink? Apparently they would hang out in this makeshift basement and one night they were all drinking, doing drugs, messing around, and a couple of the guys who were there that evening began talking about Tara, how they'd been involved in her disappearance and her eventual murder. They claimed that they were following her that day and they hit her purposely with their truck, grabbed her and put her into the truck and took her away. They then proceeded to rape her and when she told them she was going to tell on them, they stabbed her repeatedly with a knife until she was dead. Lawrence Romero Jr. claims that she was hidden in that makeshift basement for quite a while until they moved her and buried her in a pond somewhere. When Henry kind of spoke out and was like, oh, this is not good, Lawrence basically looked at him and said, if you tell anyone, I'll kill you. And then as if that verbal threat wasn't scary enough, he actually sent a man to Henry's house with a gun to kind of like cement in the idea that he would be in big trouble if he opened his mouth. By the time he was months away from his life ending, I guess that Henry Brown just didn't care anymore. Even after all of this evidence coming out, even after witnesses coming forward who have been so scared to talk for years but are now coming forward, the case really still isn't going anywhere. And since so many of the suspects are dead now, obviously Lawrence Jr. was playing Russian roulette and his life ended and Paul Zeiler died as well. And JJ, once again, I think he's still alive but I'm not sure where he's at and um, I don't know if he was actually involved in the murder and rape of this girl but I'm not sure. Because so many of them are dead, I almost feel like law enforcement's like, what's the point, you know? Even if he did do it, he's dead, what are we gonna do? And the point is that there needs to be some kind of closure. People need to see that this girl didn't die and then have her manner of death completely covered up by the people that she knew and grew up with and trusted. There needs to be some sort of justice for Tara Calico and maybe a body or some kind of remains that her family can bury to have a gravestone to visit and talk to her, to have her laid at rest and be at peace. There is a way you can help though if you want to put some pressure on politicians and law enforcement to actually solve this case. Please call the district attorney Lemuel Martinez at 505-861-0311 and ask him to make arrests in this case. You can also call the attorney general of the state of New Mexico, Hector Balderas, at 505-490-4060 and ask him to investigate the corruption in this case. Nobody's accusing anybody, nobody's saying anything besides something in this case isn't right. I told you at the beginning of this video that I felt really connected to Tara. I spent a lot longer researching this case than I usually do, more than I really could have afforded to considering I have other videos that I need to do, but I couldn't pull myself away from the story. I couldn't pull myself away from the idea and the thought, which was terrifying that a girl could grow up in a community, go to school, go to church, see these people every day, that something so unfair and unjust could happen to her, and that the people who lived in her community, who saw her at school, who went to church with her, who were friends of her and her family, watched her grow up from a little girl, that they could know what happened to her and not come forward and say anything. 
I give Melinda a great deal of credit and respect because it takes somebody who's really brave, who's really ballsy, and who really has an innate sense of justice to come forward and say something's wrong when nobody else wants to. If that is in fact what happened to Tara, she deserved a lot better than she got. Her mother passed away, unfortunately never knowing what happened to her daughter, and her birth father also died. But she is survived by her stepfather and her stepsister Michelle, who will never stop looking for the truth. She says Tara was a good person. She would have gone on to do good things in the world. She would have been a positive force in the world. She didn't deserve what happened to her. And she doesn't deserve now to have her death and disappearance covered up because people are afraid of telling the truth. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I'm sorry if it was a little bit of a longer video than I anticipated going in. I just got carried away. Like I said, I was with this case for a while. I was with Tara for a while. So many details went in my head that I didn't even realize, that I didn't even write down as notes that came out when I was talking about it. So it probably ended up being a little bit longer than I expected, but I wanted to give you guys all the details that I had because this case needs to be made as public as possible, it needs to get out there. This could happen to anybody, and that is why I really familiarize myself with the victims personally before I go into researching a case. Because I know this person could have been me. It could have been my sister, it could have been my daughter. It still could be somebody I know, or myself, or somebody I love. Horrible things happen to people every day. We need to stop looking at them as just cases. We need to stop looking at them as cautionary tales. We need to see the person they were, the life they lived, and the person they could have become had they been allowed to have the one thing that they were entitled to, which was their life. Thank you so much for being here with me for this super lengthy, super detailed Mystery Monday. I hope you got something out of it. Once again, I will post links to the podcast as well as to the website. And there's another podcast I listened to about Tara Calico that I also thought was really in depth and I'll post the link to that as well. I can't remember the name off the top of my head but I'll post it in there. If you guys wanna look more into this story, there was a lot of channel news I wanted to talk about and some upcoming projects I'm gonna be working on. But I'll save that for Instagram. Go ahead and follow me on Instagram. It's just at Stephanie Harlow, my name. I'm a little emotionally exhausted from delving so deep into this case and finally like spilling it all to you. So I'm just going to end it here and tell you guys that I can't wait to see you next time. Thank you so much for being here with me. Stay kind and stay beautiful. Mwah. Bye. The same lie every day Another smile I will fake Playing along Playing along I fall asleep when I wake up And in my dreams I'll be pain in the world Pain in the world A world I built with immense care A parallel universe where The thought of boredom is too abstract